I recently got my hands on a Casio CZ1 phase distortion synthesizer from 1986. It's full of a lot of really cool sounds, so I sampled it and built the Casio CZ1 Ableton Live Pack. And this pack contains all 64 presets that I multi-sampled at different velocities, so you get different timbres with every keystroke. And there's also 16 macro controls with eight macro presets. So you kind of really get like 512 sounds with this instrument. Right now the music is made entirely with this pack, including the drums. Phase distortion was a type of synthesis made by Casio that's kind of the answer to frequency modulation, which was popular in the 80s. It has a lot of those similar metallic sounds, but there's something else that's kind of special about the phase distortion sound that's unique. While programming these sounds in Ableton Live, I also use the sampler's frequency modulation features, so you kind of get the best of both worlds. And with the effects and all the parameters you can control with the macros, these instruments are more fun than the actual synthesizer. They're easier to control, there's a more diverse sound range, and they're all available at your fingertips. The Casio CZ1 pack is available at my site, brianfunk.com slash Casio. And if you're a member of the Music Production Club, you will get this included with your membership this month. The Music Production Club gets you my latest releases as soon as they're released at a fraction of the normal cost, as well as a whole bunch of other Ableton Live packs, tutorials, video courses, and access to our community where like-minded producers like you are sharing each other's work, supporting each other, and helping each other make music. It's a lot of fun. we got some cool challenges going on right now, as well as a fall 2020 compilation, which you can be part of. That's the Music Production Club at brianfunk.com slash mpc. And I want to thank my buddy Dave for thinking of me when he saw the Casio CZ1 at a local garage sale. Thanks, Dave. Hello, welcome to the Music Production Podcast. On today's show, I got Julian Falco Perone, and he is a musician out of Denver, Colorado. He's got, um, I would call it, I'll describe it, um, <laughs> and then I'll let you do it too, but I'd say it's like a vintage, psychedelic, folk rock kind of thing. There's a lot of stuff you're pulling in. The aesthetic on like your website and your art and your album is very... Uh, like late 60s, early 70s kind of vibe. Um, I was really drawn to it by just the sound and the music and the songwriting. Um, I, I do also enjoy the fact that there's just this kind of like cohesive uh, vibe and feeling going on to everything. And like some of your influences are the Beatles and the Beach Boys. So that's that's right up my alley too. Um, but Jolene's here to talk to us about his process. And uh, he's got a new album out called In My Garden which is awesome. I've gotten to listen to it and um, enjoying it quite a lot. So, Julian, it's great to have you here, man. Thanks, man. Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, having me. It's great to finally be here talking with you. Yeah, yeah. It's, we went through a lot, you know, just so everyone knows at home here that <laughs> we, we had a few cancellations. We had an injury, um, all kinds of stuff tried to get in our way, but here we are doing it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so well, all good things take a little effort here. <laughs> Oh, for real, yeah. <laughs> so congrats on the album, man. Thanks. Yeah, it just came out on uh, Friday the 11th and kind of had a little bit of a, a listening party for it here in my hometown in Denver. Uh, I partnered with this really cool uh, vintage sort of consignment shop called Garage Sale, and they had me, uh, they allowed me to kind of come in and set up, and we had like a full listening party. And like you mentioned, the cohesiveness between the, you know, that vintage of vibe and aesthetic was really something that store had just walking into it. It really captured me. So it was cool to kind of be able to sit down and par like partner with them. It just was a really cool fit. So, but yeah, I'm really excited for this album to finally come out. And it's, it's been a long process. Something I started back in the pandemic and now finally getting it to see it all come out has, has been really fulfilling. Yeah, that's cool. And that does sound like a great match for you. Um, you know, I think a person would be forgiven to think that uh, maybe they were looking at like somebody that was from like the 60s, 70s time period when they see your stuff. <laughs> and um, and even the, in the sounds and in the video, which I think we're going to talk about a bit too. Um, but it's cool that um, it's nice to start to hear about some of these stories of stuff 
good stuff from the pandemic time when people were a little bit isolated and had to find something to do. And now the fruits of those labors are showing up all over the place. It's, yeah. I'm glad to hear that you were able to take that time and be productive. No, yeah, that's, that's interesting to think about too. Like I think about that too. Like eventually you're just going to see this wave of, and we're already starting to kind of see it, but I think there's just like almost a new art movement could potentially come from it or just like, you know, a whole wave of, career changes in general. I mean, I switched jobs. I, my whole life changed in a lot of ways, like so many other people, like between, you know, new job, new uh, place I'm living, moving in with a girlfriend and just everything kind of changed. And so it's, it's interesting to see how many people, you know, how people come out on the other side of something like that. Mm. Yeah. I'm, I'm literally waiting on vinyl records myself. Um, I've yeah. got, playing with a couple friends, you know, when it first was like kind of awesome. safe to get together, mm -hmm. we decided to risk it with each other and, um, yeah, finish right. the recording like in the spring, I guess. And, um, you know, we're still waiting on those vinyls. It's like a hundred year turnaround. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was like, an, I think, I think I waited nine months for my, I ordered my records back in 21, like, I don't know, somewhere towards, or it might have just been January of this year. So and they're finally, <laughs> I, I've had them for a little while. I've been sitting on them for a little bit, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was such a long process getting those. I think there was, a, I mean, they were going through a shortage, right? Like a lot of the plants didn't have a lot of resources either. I think, yeah, the resources and then just demand is up so much because people want to make records right. more than ever, or at least in recent memory, you know? Yeah. So, and then there aren't a ton of places that are doing it, though they are starting to pop up more and more. It's a, I guess, a combination yeah. of factors. Um, for me, it's the, f we got our test pressings back and it's the first time I've ever heard any of my music on okay. a vinyl and that was cool. Um, I've, you know, I'm so yeah. close to the music, you know, mixing it and, uh, you know, for months, like you ever, I think most people here can relate to how close you get to your own songs but it's so funny how when you put it on that medium mm -hmm. it's the same file but it just it goes to a new level it's really pretty cool there's a depth or something that happens yeah. no and it's very true i remember getting like my test pressings too and, and and hearing them hearing it back like the little like you said you get so close with the record that any sort of little change you're like almost like afraid for a second you're like what happened oh no that might just be the medium kind of taking its toll and, and like that's kind of what you want and trying to you know just imagine recording on that medium too like that i've experimented a little bit with that but not ever a full release so like that's just the next level and it's a whole nother thing to dive into but it, it's fun putting it onto physical formats like that mm -hmm. and just seeing the, the ways it takes over because it, it's going to dominate in a way and kind of you know, you have to play to it rather than it working around you. Right. <laughs> and it is nice to have those, uh, an actual thing, you know? So like music mm -hmm. is so yeah. intangible these days we with streaming, you know, it's really convenient. It's nice how I consume almost all of my music. Um, but when you get the thing, it is, it's fun. It brings it to life a little bit. Oh yeah. Oh, it really does. I mean, that, that's how I was too with, uh, I, and this release, I, I, my first album, I kind of went with vinyl specifically or, or exclusively rather. And this one, I kind of tried something with vinyl and I made my own cassettes just to kind of have another, you know, been getting kind of more into the cassette vibe a little bit um, and playing with it's, it's a more, I guess, attainable format of tape that for me right now with uh, what I'm able to play with. And it's just more, it's just something I hadn't really experienced, experimented a lot with. It was like kind of making my own and recording to tape a little bit and then kind of, you know, burning the tapes. But even for this album for In My Garden, I kind of made all the artwork. I, uh, like I said, I put the music onto the tape and kind of printed everything and assembled all of the cassettes. So it's just, that was a, a process. I didn't realize how much work I got myself into. I mean, it was like mm. hours and hours. Of, I mean, real time also, like make you know, putting the music on there. It's it's all real time. So, oh, so you you 13, produce those fourteen hours, those cassettes yourself, like by just yeah. dubbing them. Exactly. Yeah, oh, I cool. Them. I yeah. I mean, I grew up doing that. You know, mm -hmm. in like bands in high school, we'd 
yeah. we've like recorded onto our four track and then you recorded onto another tape that was your master so it lost something there <laughs> and then you're uh, yeah. you're putting it in like another tape deck to get to a copy i mean by the time it gets to there it's two generations now and but like you said real time you just got to sit there and wait for it yeah no it's, and, it's 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 a lot of fun though yeah i mean we were thrilled to do it we were like awesome yeah. let's let's sit around and make <laughs> tapes like we got together and that's what we did when we hung out just waited yeah. for it to end and flipped it over and <laughs> <laughs> did you um do you notice any kind of sonic differences between the vinyl and the tape? Anything specific? Is there one you prefer? Interesting. Well, you know, there is one that was unintentional, and it's the the deck that I bought is like a little uh, it's Technics or Techniques. Uh, it's a double deck, so it has two independent cassettes that you, you can record both at the same time. And so I got that one thinking it would have my process um, which it did, but for some reason it, it has a little tape control on it, like a speed and it was set to zero. And I tried demoing out a couple, like listening back, um, to a few cassettes before I went and made mine, everything sounded right, except it was sped up a little bit. So I had to kind of adjust the speed on my own. When I made the cassettes, they came back and all of the cassettes that I made were slightly faster. But I kind of like it. I mean, it's not anything extreme, but it's kind of like its own unique. This is the cassette version. I mean, just a little, you know, and like you said, you get so familiar with your own tracks. It's kind of nice hearing them in just a little bit of a different way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a huge difference, of course, from the uh, from the vinyl. But I think it I think it added, you know, just a new feel to it. Um, it's also not as uh, I think the vinyl itself is more bright, like just the quality of the tape like the cassettes themselves and you know, they have a lot of low end like the ones that i particularly uh made so it, but it, it's it, it's interesting to go back and forth and then listen to the digital one as well because it's all the same source so it's it's just crazy to hear how those mediums really do change and you got to listen to them I'm, I'm not sure how, how noticeable they would be to anyone else but it's when you're familiar with your own stuff you really pick up on all that yeah, you get so close that you you can pick up those minute <laughs> little details. But yeah. to I wonder the same thing. Like, will anyone really notice? And we all just kind of decided like we're we're doing this for us. Like, let's not fool anybody yeah. here. Like, there's there's no one waiting for this album to come out. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's a lot of fun though. Yeah, um, you know that there are some like famous cases too of um the tape being sped up you know on purpose like yeah. during the mastering of the, i know um caroline no on at the end of pet sounds by the beach boys mm -hmm. was uh, brian wilson's dad i guess told him he sounded too old so they sped it up to make him sound a little younger <laughs> and uh I heard that's that particular story but that, i know a lot of instances like you're talking about where they would speed stuff up slow stuff mm -hmm. down to kind of like you know the beatles would do that a lot famously like to kind of uh, on when I'm 64, I'm pretty sure they sped up Paul a little bit so he could kind of hear himself in a little different way. And I heard, maybe I read or heard somewhere that they did that too, just because they were like, well, I was tired of hearing it so many times that I just wanted to hear it in a new pitch. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, that sounds like a better song. You know, <laughs> it's just That's funny. kind of funny. So I've done a lot of stuff like that too to play around with. There's a track on my first record called Dreamland. Uh, the song, the album's called Dreamland. The song is called Swamp Stomp. And I recorded the song uh, about two or three semitones faster and slowed the whole thing down to what you get on the album is the slowed version. And then I put the vocals on top of that. But the instrumentation was all initially recorded at a much faster rate. So mm -hmm. that was kind of me messing with that mindset that they did. Yeah. Well, um, they just did a re-release of revolver by the beatles and they've yep. got um rain like i guess uh, one of the singles that wasn't on the record they, they had so much material they would just make oh, yeah. singles and put out separate <laughs> albums but uh they played that fast and slowed down the music too and they have the original right. version at the normal speed and it's it's fast it's like it's like almost like the Ramones, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, that's funny. I started digging into that one. I hadn't gotten all the way through, but that rain is a great example of, of another time. I'd heard they'd done that, so it's cool to finally be able to hear 
like mm -hmm. this is what it actually was. I mean, I guess you could speed it up yourself, but to, to know exactly, you know, where it was is, is kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's like um, the kind of thing, I guess, back in those days, there weren't as many options, you know, as, like yeah. we have every plugin and every piece of gear available that's companies right. coming out with i mean like today i just happen to see in the synth world like moog is putting the model d out again for the second time and then wow. uh, also sequential announced the new synth as well and it's like <laughs> i mean we are we have so much gear these days and stuff to work with that like they decided like we have an effect it's called very speed let's play with that and see what we can do <laughs> and and now yeah. like you were kind of just mentioning earlier how you were adjusting the tape speed on your record on your your tape deck and it's like just to kind of fix it that's yeah less of an effect <laughs> right no that's that's funny well and, and that touches on something that i very much believe in as an artist of like you know we do have too many options these days i wouldn't say too many but there's so many options it, it comes down to i guess how you use it it's good to have all these different things you can pull from but I think the limitations that a lot of these guys had to deal with and any art form you know filmmaking is another great example of that dealing with a physical medium and you only have so much footage and you know your budget might be pretty huge on a major motion picture but it's at the end of the day you've got so much film that <laughs> you're going to start running through it pretty quick so but just to you know I like to put myself in the position of those guys like in their their headspace a little bit try to relay, like okay this is what they had to work with let me try to get there to an extent and just make music and not worry so much about like well what sound can i use here i've got a 50 million options to pick from why don't i pick some of the ones that are or you know i use a lot of analog synths too and it's like this is the sound of it and, you know and you can obviously mm -hmm. manipulate it in post or you can do a lot of things to it but let's just make this the sound and worry about other things. Cause I think they, uh, so many great songs. I wonder how much they actually spent thinking about the sounds they had because they didn't have anything else. This is just what it sounded like. So they're not sitting there really fretting over, well, this is what the synth sounds like. So it's just going to be it. Or this is a piano. Like, like I'm just playing it and they're focusing more on, other areas of the songwriting so I, I think that's a place I try to it's a fun area to put yourself in as a as a songwriter and a producer so that's a lot of where I try to work is kind of that space where where creativity can thrive I think a little more because I know I, I'm just like anyone else I, I've got so many options too I can sit there and, and overanalyze and overthink about how I want to portray something and how it should sound but I find my best work to be when I just kind of settle on the mm. bare minimum hmm. yeah you kind of got me thinking um before i started really i guess working on a computer that was the turning point mm -hmm. for me when suddenly i had every possible choice in front of me but right. there i'd get like a sound i'd find somewhere whether it was like i mean i can remember putting paper like a little strip of paper weaving it through my guitar <laughs> strings so it gets like a funny little buzz to it almost makes it sound like a banjo or something and that was really exciting and it's like oh, i'm gonna make songs with this sound and now sometimes those things are a little less exciting because there's so many millions of other things you can do at the same time and i think you know, back in those days too, they, they'd get like one new little toy and they'd be like oh let's let's do something weird with this the the overabundance of options almost takes away from the value of the individual thing if if you're not careful like you can you know with discipline you can retain that value by just not letting yourself go to every possible choice like you said yeah. settling no, i think that's really fair and, and it's something you touched on too of like uh they you can hear it like throughout the history. I mean, just to use Beatles, the Beatles for an example, it's like as soon as they, they started playing, as soon as like Rhodes and electric pianos started becoming more prominent, they started showing up on their albums. Like they just used them. So it's like the technology they had and like mode with the synthesizers, like 
they would just get one and they would bring it in and they would use it on like a few songs and it's just like you can kind of it's funny when you look through an artist's discography at that time period and kind of listen through it same thing with the beach boys like they started playing with synths in the 70s like when they came out and it's just like one or two sounds and you hear that sound a little bit throughout a few mm. songs on, on a couple different records so it's funny to like you can almost trace history of when technology changed based on the album it, it's a fascinating thing that i kind of pick up on sometimes i i'm into that kind of stuff like listening to the evolution of an artist sound through that time period it's like they were getting more and more tools uh, as we as they went along yeah as they went along right so they can like slowly put it in there instead of as yeah. someone that begins today gets everything just yeah. just by getting garage band on your phone <laughs> yeah. you know you've got so many choices and sounds you can use which is awesome but it can it can be really kind of um paralyzing too where you, yeah. you don't know what to do what sounds should i you never settle on anything right. oh yeah absolutely it, it's one of the nice things about having like a piece of hardware like you said like a an analog synth is kind of cool because you have to record the audio. You, mm -hmm. It's not a VST that you can change later on, you know, yeah. and you might, that might, you know, that's the selling point of the digital world is that you can change it, but sometimes just being stuck with it, now you have to work with it instead of thinking like, all right, we could just get rid of that. Yeah. Try something new. That was very true. And you can always manipulate manipulate stuff later too with analog gear, but at least you have something started. You have like, you know, this is my starting point. This is the sound I'm working with and whatever I want to do with it in post, sure, or you know, as I get it tracked. But that's like the biggest step is like getting those block or the building blocks in place of like tracking. And like as soon as you're able to kind of get some foundation at least for like someone just starting that's like the best place to go just like mm. get some stuff down yeah i, th I think for me too uh, you know the, probably yeah. the longer i go the oh, more i realize yeah. i need to like actually have that like this is what i'm working with and and that's it <laughs> <laughs> just i yeah. have to make this sound work i have to make this drum set sound it has to fit the song or else it's not gonna work right no absolutely what what is the process like for you um so if you if you don't mind like maybe like putting us in back in the pandemic times you know for <laughs> old times sake <laughs> um but like, yeah how did no, it yeah, start and like yeah <laughs> <laughs> like as far as um, my process in the studio or just kind of uh yeah, even how if, the songs came about. Yeah. yeah, even how the songs come about. Like, how do you work? Do you start on a certain instrument, or do you um, mix it up a lot? Yeah. Well, I. It's interesting. The, the pandemic for me allowed it allowed me to kind of try new things and put myself in a new space. Like, there was a minute there I wasn't making music at all. I was just kind of like, I'm just gonna stop. And I got a lot into filmmaking. I was really making a lot of stuff. And I shoot with Super Eight. Um, so I shoot a lot of stuff with film and kind of playing around with that, but it kind of let me sit, sit away from music for a while and kind of develop a new process. Um, mm. and I kind of, I mean, we, we started the whole in my garden album, the name comes from, we started becoming like plant parents and, you know, adopting like all these plants into our house and only well, we had like 30 plants throughout our house and it just created this different energy being around the plants and I mean, you're surrounded by them. It just something about it feels different. And a lot of this particular album was written on an acoustic guitar, just be, being surrounded by these plants. I mean, it sounds very sixties. The more I describe it, like just sitting around like, you know, a campfire or something, it's not so much that, but it's just, I think a lot of the, the songs came from an acoustic or a piano and just really writing the song super stripped and it allowed me to kind of sit back and add things in later. Um, so I wrote a lot of the songs that they ended up being more folk sounding because they are on an acoustic guitar, whereas other stuff I've made in the past, it just like the instrument I start on almost dictates the genre <laughs> that I'm going to go in. And it's kind of a weird thing, I guess. But this one kind of I started a lot with with acoustic. And once I have that down, um, I mean, every song is kind of a, a different process. It's hard to kind of pinpoint 
what my exact process is. Um, but I, I would say a lot of it is writing uh, on one instrument. I don't try to think about what I'm going to be doing on any other instrument until I have this kind of demoed out and tracked out. And a lot of times there were some songs on the record that I made with a piano and the piano ended up not even being featured on it at all in the end. It's just kind of where I started the song and it ended up being built into something completely different. So that kind of process changes song to song and album to album. Um, I find that I, I really like using a Mellotron too. A Mellotron is kind of part of my sound that I like to incorporate. I recently picked one up during the pandemic as well. Um, and it's something that is all over, you know, the Beach Boys and Needles Records and Bowie Records and just all of those 70 sounds. So that was kind of another thing that put me in that mindset of like, uh, it's just a really cool instrument. So a lot of that, on, on, there's a lot of the Mellotron on the new record as well. And so is that I don't know. just to interrupt yeah, you? Sorry, yeah. Mellotron is a fun topic. <laughs> yeah, it is. Is, it's a is that um, <laughs> is that like an old one? Because I, you know, this is their new. I it, guess you, okay. They're digital ones that they put out, but they are the same sounds. Like the guy, okay. I was actually talking with with Marcus, like the same guy that he. I don't know the extent of it, but it's like within the family, I guess they have all the same sounds of the original one. And they just put them digitally so you have them for you. But I mean, for anyone that doesn't know, Mellotron is like recorded tape loops of like analog instruments. So, like, you can get saxophones and, you know, brass sections, horn, uh, string sections, flutes, all these things that were like an actual player back in the day recording it to tape. And then they would put that into a, com uh, or into a computer, into, a <laughs> into tape. They, the, they would take the tape and put it into the keyboard. So you'd have like these little tape loops that you're sitting there playing. So the one I have is like the digital version of that. It's just a kind of nice, smaller, compact version to move around. But um, I definitely looked into getting an original one. I mean, it just seems like a nightmare at these days. Like nothing's in tune. Yeah. I imagine fixing that up would just be insane. But Oh, yeah. I, I was <laughs> curious if that's what you were getting into because that is that yeah. you know the tape tape is not going to last forever that degrades oh. and yeah. you know i mean it would have its own sound to it but it probably wouldn't be yeah. good it would be a lot of uh you'd have to fix a lot of things i imagine uh, to, I to bet make that sound more perfect. yeah a ton of work a ton of maintenance i mean sometimes yeah. even just any old gear is but that in particular yeah. seems like it's I mean, I mean i've never had one or played one in real life but uh i can only imagine that must be a real serious upkeep oh, yeah. yeah but yeah it makes sense <laughs> no to that that would be part of your your sound yeah yeah it's it's just a really cool a lot of that started because of i i love the idea of strings and horns and or woodwinds all these things like these classic you know, Brian Wilson, I think, once said that he he kind of makes rock music uh, or he takes like classical music and puts it in a rock setting. And I really admire that approach. And that's kind of something that really resonates with me. Like I like to incorporate these older instruments and but I don't play any of them. So, you know, physically. So but I'm able to kind of write the parts out and kind of, you know, write the music for it. And it, the Mellotron seemed as the served as the perfect way to, you know, get that music across because it is like kind of how they how they were used initially. It's like they were made so that people didn't have to hire a full band. They could hire a guy to kind of come in and play, you know, a full sound. They have like rhythm loops and like bass. So you can kind of like make a full band out of one hmm. keyboard. That was kind of like their initial intention. And of course, you know, musicians took it to a different level and kind of went with it in the 60s and 70s and kind of changed it from their original purpose but yeah it just served as a really cool way to to do something like that i feel like that's the it's the kind of idea that if someone came up with today you'd be uh -huh. like no way that's that's insane <laughs> like you can have all these tape loops in there but that's yeah. you know what they had to work with and you know there weren't computers like we're used to having samplers these days that can do that kind of stuff mm -hmm. so it's just such a cool human you know ingenuity type of thing like we need this and this is the only way we're going to get it so 
Hmm. And it had such a cool sound too because of the medium. Like obviously to make, you know, it was all recorded to tape. So then it's like you get the second level of tape when somebody then puts it on their album because, hmm. you know, that gets pressed to vinyl and it's got like, you're hearing it on tape twice. So it's got like a little natural degrading happening by the time that, you know, the, the audience is actually getting to hear that track. So that's another fascinating thing about it too. Is like, you know, it's just like several layers of degrading happening there. Right. Yeah. It's super cool. <laughs> So that kind of informed your writing of these songs in the album then as well? Yeah, I would say so. It, it, it's tough to really pinpoint, man. It's like there's a lot of, as far as a process, it really does change uh, yeah. song to song. You but know? you like to have some, you like to have the song, you know, before you start recording it. I would it. say so. <laughs> um, but to an extent, there's, there's a track, the, the opening track on the album is called Can't Be Trusted. And that's initially... The way I wrote that was on an acoustic guitar. I had the whole thing kind of figured out. And I had the song, I'm like sitting there, recorded it, I had it every layer, and I'm now I'm just working on the mix a little bit, and I think I'm there. And as I'm mixing it, I realize like this isn't the right version. This is not I gotta re-record the whole thing. It's just not mm -hmm. right. So down that way I recorded a whole nother like faster tempo, you know, different kind of version. So it's like there's there's ways that you your process changes so much song to song that even like halfway through <laughs> one song where I think it's done, I end up like changing the entire thing. And and by the way, both of these versions ended up making the record. It's the first and last track. I kind of put both versions. It's kind of like almost similar to, I guess, Revolution, how they've got like the acoustic version um, on uh, the White Album. And then they put out like a single that was much more like, faster paced yeah it's kind of similar vibe with how they came together one the the one version on my album the, the first track is more acoustic very vocally uh, a lot of vocal harmonies kind of layered together and the last version of that song ended up being more of an aggressive vocal i'm like screaming at times and and ended up being a lot of like there's a i have a lot of like dixieland jazz influence like from louis armstrong and some of the those early days so I tried to incorporate that sort of feel in a modern like rock setting. So it's kind of like a folk inspired Dixieland backing of these like mm -hmm. horn, a full horn section that kind of went together with my more aggressive vocal. So it's like, I could have just had to have both versions in the end, make it onto the record. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it's, it's hard. I guess all that to say that my process really does change song to song. And there's, I, I don't know if I've ever really had a consistent, sort of method there yeah well i'm the same too i i, I think that's yeah. often the answer people give sure totally yeah yeah because it's fun to try new things because some um, we get in ruts sometimes too you know if you do a few things the same way and um either it gets a little boring or things sound the same or sometimes yeah. it just doesn't always work every time I think it depends on yeah. what you're what you're coming up with where you are and there are just times um i mean for me it depends on where i am how i'm feeling what time of day what time of year and yeah. um if there are people around it's totally different um so you, you just uh well, that's fair there's so many variables and factors that go into it too like there's times where i feel motivated and I'll sit down and make some of the worst sounding music I've ever come up with. And then there's times where I'm like, there, there's initially no motivation, but I sit down, you know, kind of telling myself, well, maybe the mo maybe it'll come, the inspiration will be there. Just kind of sit down and play around with it. And starting from a place of blank emptiness, there's no desire to make anything right now. I sometimes in those moments create my best work. It's just like sitting down and, not forcing yourself to do it, but you know, it's an interesting headspace to play with too, is when you're not inspired because mm -hmm. you can kind of start playing around with things and you think about them in different ways. Cause you're, you're not excited <laughs> about everything at once. You're just like, you, you really hone in on the things that, okay, well, you know what? I'm not very inspired, but this one thing I did kind of gave me a spark. Let's explore that. Whereas if you're like so excited and everything is, I've, I'm going to make the best song ever everything is too exciting so you can't really hone in and pinpoint what gives you that motivation if that makes sense at all. Mm. 
Yeah, I never thought about it that way, like being over inspired almost. Where right. yes, everything's great. And then Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's too good. Yeah. We do it gets to the end. Yeah. We fight Go the ahead. inner critic so hard, but if the inner critic doesn't show up, then it's a disaster. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's really true though. And it's it's cool to hear you say that. That sometimes you just have to start and you you need like the action and then maybe if you're lucky the inspiration comes. Yeah. Um but I never really thought about it as sort of a good way to um be a little more um like discerning in your ideas to be a little less accepting because sometimes yeah you can be a little too open <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah i mean those like like i was saying and just i feel like when you're too in the moment there's so many options of course and it just everything feels too right like, there, there's you're not you're not kind of uh stopping yourself from getting too excited there like you kind of i feel like there's no barrier like you're just kind of putting everything at the wall, which I guess that that's a good thing too. There's nothing wrong with that by any means, but there's times where I'll, I'll definitely try to put myself in a position of recording something, even when I'm not really wanting to. And if it doesn't work after a while, I, I'm definitely not forcing it. I think that's important too, is like, there's a good medium of like, it, just put yourself in that position. And if you're still not feeling it, okay, let's back away for a second and maybe come back tomorrow or, something like that but you know because I, I don't really think of it as terms of like i have deadlines to meet or anything but i try to give myself like i, I want to finish this let's go like i think in the past i've there's been times where it, it's easy to be like oh, there's nobody i'm my own boss here i'm my own you know there's nobody stopping this from taking a year um but it's just like i think in such an era that we find ourselves in of you know three seconds is kind of the attention span of a lot of people you just got to get stuff out there you just you don't take so much time to worry about the little details and, and it's kind of inf unfortunate in its own way but i think it's also a good thing that just like not not so much stressing over the quality of something just like really just try to finish it see it through to the end i mean there's so much power in seeing a complete product as opposed to like you know 80 80 different songs you've started and can't figure out where to go with them yeah there's finishing is it's the hardest thing to do it's the most yeah. rewarding thing to do as well and mm -hmm. it's scary too i think because you when you have all these like really cool ideas that are kind of floating yeah. around they have all this potential energy and in your mind and the imagination they can go in so many cool ways and they can be perfect and they're going to be this thing but as soon as you start honing it in and working on it, it's just a shadow of that, really. And it's yeah. it's an imperfect reality. And here you are with this thing, and now you have to come to terms with it a little bit. That I really, it's it's not always a disappointment, but it's what I'm. I guess I'm saying is it's scary to take it there because I think we kind of know what if I can't do with it what I think it can be yeah it's hard it's hard to let go of something like that too it's it's never really finished ever it's just kind of it's it's only ever to the point where you let it go and consider like this is i gotta set it down mm. but there's always a million things i mean you hear artists all the time in the past too say like i mean these are classic songs that people adore and build their whole careers off of like these this is the source of their inspiration and then you hear the artist it's just like yeah, that was never done. I didn't learn. I didn't really like that how it came out. You're just like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? So it's just wild to think about. Like, somebody might value your work and see it from a different light because they're not part of your process, you know. So it's mm. that's another thing that I think is it makes it easier, I guess, to to finish things and let it go. It's just to, the more work you put into something doesn't necessarily make it better either, you know. It, it, yeah. Oftentimes, you you definitely pass a point where it's you're just ruining it, so you gotta let it go. Oh yeah, I mean, you just kind of beat it into a pulp version of itself, and I've sure. ruined many songs that way, where I've just overdone it. I'm like, ugh, 
you know, like all the souls gone, all this, right. all the initial thing that I had for it has been like covered up. Um, but it is funny when you hear that, you hear like the perfect song like, mm -hmm. that's been around forever and they're like, eh, well, but they have all of that imagination still attached to it, all that potential energy that yeah. it's just impossible when you have an idea in your head that has all this potential and all these different possible directions. It's like the quantum mechanics thing where if you don't observe it, it can, that, you don't know about the particle can yeah. go anywhere. It's, it's everywhere yeah. at the same time. <laughs> but as soon as you look at it, as soon as you finish the song, it's a thing, it's one. So yeah. it can't also be that other kind of cool direction that you had in mind. But we don't hear that. Only the artist has exactly. that. It's exactly. just like another curse of being the artist. Like you don't yeah. get you don't get to hear your song for the first time. You don't know you don't get to be surprised by that cool thing that you do. It's yeah. um I mean, it's hard to that, I think about that all the time of just like how do people hear my music or how do they portray that thing I did or that mix? I mean like how does it cuz you can always compare it to other things that you know, but n nobody will ever know your own stuff like you do and hear it like you do is like you're saying so it's just it's always a fascinating thing to think about like i, I want to hear my own music through somebody else's ears but there's just no way to do that right now <laughs> maybe the technology's coming that's the future. right some sort of hear like memory yeah. racer <laughs> right. well how often do you hear a song where you actually know every single little element that's going on in it you know, every track, you know, every percussion, uh, how many guitars were layered in, you know, what effects were on it, what amp, what mic, like, yeah. you just don't hear anything like that, but that's how you go through the process with your own music. No, that's true. Even tracks that you sit down as a producer and you say, all right, I'm going to dissect this thing. I'm going to, you know, I mean, unless you have the luxury of stems and which is often the case, I guess, I never really look at other people's stems though I, I guess i know some people that have done that but i like to just hear the finished thing as like an artist and what they you know dissect what i can hear from their track because in the end that's all that somebody's going to hear of my track is the final product so what is what is it that i'm hearing that's working even when you're sitting there and trying to analyze and and pull apart every little thing in somebody else's track you still don't know everything that's going on there you're still probably missing the half of I mean, mm. you can hear a lot, but I mean, that's something I think about too is how much am I really missing, you know, based on just because it's all working together, y you really would have to pull it apart uh, physically. They'd have to get in their system and, and hear the track solo to kind of know exactly what's working and why it does a certain way. But I love doing that kind of stuff too. It's, it's a lot of fun to, to break down. Mm. But even at that, if you have the entire session, the master tapes yeah. or whatever, <laughs> You, you're still not there you're not in the room you don't know who else was in the room who was watching or all, all those factors that really do play a kind of intangible role in everything like, like your plants you were talking about while you're writing your songs on your guitar like that you can't see that or hear that but it i know what you mean it does have a an effect on how you behave and how you felt in the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had no really desire to make a more folk rock inspired album either until I started making it. That's that was the interesting mm -hmm. thing and something that I'm figuring out about myself as an artist is that I mean, I think every artist writes where they're interested in at the time, you know, with the cur current moment, they're very moment to moment, but more so, I, I find myself bouncing around to an extent of like, I mean, my first record was very psychedelic and much more, let me use the studio as an instrument. I want to kind of record, I mean, I was throwing vocals through uh, guitar pedals and pianos through guitar pedals, all kinds of things, messing around with uh, vocals through Leslie's, I mean, all kinds of weird sounds. And then this record was like, I had every anticipation of making something else like that and just being around a, this plant the, the pandemic you know the whole vibe of the pandemic i guess was just like isolation this is what mm. you have so that's kind of where the record came from too like this is what we have this is let's use an acoustic guitar this is a tangible thing it's a very simple thing 
let's use it in tandem with the inspiration that these plants are giving me and just kind of see where it goes. And that's kind of where it took me as a more, I, I describe it, it's hard to explain and maybe you're better at uh, describing what you heard from the album and what it sounded like to you. Uh, Cause again, I'm too close to it and it's hard to even maybe pinpoint what genre it is. But I, I, I hear a lot of like Crosby, Stills and Nash influence of like the vocal harmonies, but also like some, just some you know, that classic folk sound that you can get from a George Harrison record as well, like some of his solo stuff. And I don't know, what, what do you kind of hear in listening to it? I'd love to get your take. I hear all that stuff in there. I also hear kind of like a, almost like a jam band element. Yeah. Y you know, but not so much in that because you're going on long jams really. Because yeah. I think most, you know, most of the songs seem like they're songs. They're not, it's not like, and now we're going to jam on this part for right. a <laughs> long time. But like the delivery sometimes has that feeling, Grateful Dead-ish kind of thing. Um, in, in, a, in a good way, you know, I know sometimes you say that and some people love it oh, and yeah. some people get right. a little upset. But um, I'm kind of neutral in, in the Grateful Dead world, like where I'm very neutral as well. Like, I, I can't, <laughs> and I don't think I can name a record either. Like, like I've heard, I've heard songs throughout the years. I just can't. I, I've never gone one way or the other with, you know. Yeah. Some people are so anti. Uh, yeah, Dead that's that's why I don't want you to think that. But right. Oh uh, yeah. I, no, I have okay. a, lot, a bunch of friends <laughs> that want me to get into it too, and uh, I hear mm -hmm. it, and it's cool. Um, I guess I. I've never really been into like the jam band thing, even when I'm playing. Like to me, it's it feels often like it's more for the musicians, yeah. but even when I'm doing it, it just feels kind of like you know we're just kind of doing this to yeah, we're just going. so we can play. Yeah, which as I say, it doesn't sound like a bad reason. <laughs> you know, it's right. a good reason to do anything, but it's just never captured me like that. But I, what I'm, what I'm getting at, I guess, is like, I'm hearing like that a more modern sound from that kind of stuff um, okay. coming in. And yeah, like a lot of the harmonies and the, and the vocal delivery, sometimes you reminded me of Freddie Mercury, actually. Oh, that's, not, that's not like awesome in a, not the operatic way, but just like a tone okay. in your voice, which, you know, that's, I don't see how that could ever be a negative thing to, no, <laughs> for anybody. So. Cause, um, but it's not like, I wouldn't, I don't think you guys, your, your stuff sounds like queen. Yeah. You know, <laughs> no, that's, that's interesting. I, I think, I mean, they're obviously a huge influence of mine, but I wouldn't say I make music that sounds like queen either, but they've mm. always, I mean, they're one of my favorite bands. Freddie is a guy that I believe in. I think I taught myself how to sing by listening to a lot of his delivery and trying to sing to those songs. And some of like my range comes from just a lot of what he does and trying to mimic it. And so that's, that's fascinating to hear that like some of the tonality, like I'm not singing like operatic stuff on this record or anything, but just maybe some of that tonality also came through just from the years of trying to practice and yeah. learn how to sing from listening to their music. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I like that. No, I've noticed too that I also have a lot of British influences. Like, I mean, a lot of us do, but just that that time period of like, you know, uh, the zombies as well, mm. and obviously with with Paul and some of the stuff that um, that they did uh, solo with Wings. Yeah, things like I, that. I got a little bit of that in some of the okay. like instrumentation. Yeah, you know, like it kind yeah. of reminded me of a little band on the run, like okay. a lot of the horns and stuff. And it's funny, I I noticed that I, well, what I was getting at with that is that I noticed that because of the British influence, a lot of that I sometimes will say certain syllables a little more like British. I don't know, like uh -huh. I, I sing things a certain way, and then I'll listen <laughs> to more American artists, and like I'll be singing along with their song, and they're like, "Oh, that's not how they sang that." It's just like little things I pick up on as a vocalist. Like you, you sing different syllables differently sometimes. It's, it's just mm -hmm. a weird thing that I picked up on. So the sound—I'm not British, folks. I'm, I'm American, <laughs> very American. Well, I was—you um, know—the revolver thing comes up again. I've just been listening to that yeah. a lot. Um, so I've got like this 
Beatles scores book. And it's got like every Beatles song and like chords and, you know, all the parts in notation, which I don't read, but there's, I see the chords and, you know, I can, I can tell when it's a quarter note and an eighth note, <laughs> but, yeah. um, I was learning some of the songs and it was, um, one of those, uh, it was like paperback writer actually. So even okay. the way I say it, like paperback writer, like, <laughs> like <laughs> if I was going to just talk and say a paperback writer, <laughs> I wouldn't yeah. say it that way. But in trying to sing those songs, I find myself saying it the way they said it. And I'm like, yeah. that's not how I would say that word. And if I was writing this song, I would never pronounce some of these words that way, like getting better all the time. Yeah, they're like better. <laughs> better. No, yeah. It's yeah. so fascinating. So, yeah, paperback writer. That, you know, you have different ways. You, the emphasis you know. on the T. You know, like yeah. even, like when I say twenty. 20 uh -huh. i almost don't even use a t but it's very 20 it's very 20. like more proper i'm not more proper, trying to yeah. do an accent good. but like the <laughs> the the pronunciation of the t you know as, and yeah. i'm in new york so i don't end anything with er i just uh at the end <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah. better that's like i'd be like yo it's better all the time <laughs> but <laughs> I, it's just funny how when you play it yeah. You know, I'm, I'm like saying i'm like this is just not how i would do it but yeah. because you know the song that way you kind of that stuff yeah, sneaks in think of it as like yeah it just, you're right it just sneaks in you don't even really pick up on that you're doing it it's just kind of there i think a lot of it because of it like i said it translates to how i sing sometimes too and i like to do different voices with um i think as a kid i always wanted to be a voice actor and do a lot of mm -hmm. like really weird sounds and I try to throw in, I, I try to get silly with the two of my albums and there's a couple different me's that you can find uh, and throw in different like accents in a way, like not intentionally, it's not a parody or anything, but there's just times I'll listen back and I'm like, why did I sing it that way? I guess that's just how I was feeling at the time, and, you know, or maybe a little more nasally than, than more than other days. And yeah, it, it's interesting to listen back to those kinds of things. Mm. Do you get into like a character? when you when you're like writing the songs and singing um because hmm. I, I i like i was kind of thinking about that a little bit when you were when i was listening um well sometimes when i'm doing a song it's like it's not really me yeah um although a lot of times when i listen back it's like yeah but it was in a way you know after some time has yeah. passed but it's kind of like it's this kind of character so like this person has like th like this certain confidence or swagger to them and this person doesn't have that at all and and in like oh, the okay. different songs it's like a more like maybe a more vulnerable person and then the other person it's kind of the brazen one that's strutting around <laughs> right no yeah i you know i i do find that that uh, that can change too from song to song like i mean e well just even my first record i was trying to make more of a of a concept album of like it's called dreamland and i was trying to the whole album is like one sleep cycle so from top to bottom it would be like go falling asleep and then waking up mm, at the end of cool. the record so it's kind of i definitely had different characters and different like voices and that was more intentionally too of like what i was playing with throughout the record but there's like you know different i mean just to touch back on the accents i, I definitely lean into that a little bit at certain times and there's other times on there's more characters within the story, but they're all kind of it's like I I am the person that is sleeping. So all these are all voices that I'm hearing within my dreams. So I don't think I'm really on that record, if that mm. makes sense. It's all a right. bunch of different versions of myself and manifest manifestations of like sounds and songs that I'm hearing. So that was an interesting <laughs> album to to produce like that. Hmm. That's fun. Well, a lot of times for me, the delivery doesn't really come through until I, I nail that in my head where I'm like, okay, so this is like, um, you know, like one of the songs we did, I was like, this is like Lou Reed singing this song and he's, okay. he's like feeling good and walking down the street. He's a little pissed, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that kind of stuff. When I get that in my head, 
then I understand like how to pronounce the words better and how to hold the notes or not to hold the notes or to get softer at certain points. But before I have that, it's it's like the the song hasn't been like born yet or something. No, that's fair. I think that can definitely help dictate. Like, it, it puts you in the right mindset. Of, it's almost like an actor. Like, you got to figure out who your character is to really understand like how the lines ought to be delivered. And it's kind of. I mean, I can see a lot of parallels with that with songwriting too, of like, mm. where am I coming from with this? What am I, like, I don't have to be a different version of myself, but like what, how should this be portrayed? I mean, there's a million different ways to play the same song. And that's the fun part I think too, is not stopping and, and uh, kind of being happy with the first delivery. Because I think you go through several iterations before you can find some really cool things and a lot of magic. and. I find that uh, I'll be listening to some things sometimes and just realize like how many iterations did they go through to get to this? Like there's no way this was where they started. I mean, that is just insane. And you listen back and you can find other um, like box sets or something where they show this is take one or whatever. And then you see like, oh, the, the version that we all know is take 47 or something like that. So they went through all these different experimentations of like let's do it faster let's do it more angry let's do it more stripped down let's you know all those things can contribute to how you get to that final process too so i think yeah. all that's super important to, to play around with yeah to explore it a little bit and see where yeah. it takes you that's the fun part you know i just like, saw on instagram and i if i had to bet money i'd, I'd bet you're a fan of uh the flaming lips yeah yeah i'm yeah. a fan yeah okay um so uh, the singer Wayne Coyne, Coyne, I'm not exactly sure how he pronounces it, but. I don't either, yeah. Coyne, yeah. the lead singer, his name, first Wayne. name is Wayne. <laughs> um, he was going through the new box set, I guess they're putting out for um, Yoshimi Battles the Pink Robots. Okay. Whatever that title is. Yeah. I mean, that album is awesome. That was the album that made me love that band. And it's it's like concept and everything too. And um, he's playing like some of the demos off a of four track of Do You Realize? And it's like that same sort of thing where he's got the chords and he's kind of testing out the words and it goes through it a few times. And by like the second or third time, he's like, okay. Like you can tell he like, he kind of let his subconscious do the talking. And then by the next few times around, it's like, now it's here and the song yeah. has like arrived <laughs> that's that's cool to hear that like i love when bands put that out so you can hear yeah. their process i mean i think that that kind of stuff is more for people like us than typical listeners i think they're kind of like why i don't know maybe not maybe other people like to hear that stuff too but i think we get more out of it or maybe something different out of it maybe i wouldn't say more but it, yeah it's fascinating to hear you know i mean i guess it's kind of like um, with filmmaking, if you're able to see like deleted scenes or like bonus features, it's just kind of that version, but the music world, you know, it's just a little more insight to what they're doing. And I think it really, it helps to listen to that kind of stuff for your own yeah. writing. It helps you realize like that you're on the right track, like you're on the right mm -hmm. path. Like, oh, okay, that's how I get to a place within myself or within my, a certain song I'm working on. Like, you know, you can kind of build more confidence with what you're doing by hearing other people do that same process and realizing like, oh, okay, there's nothing wrong with taking, you know, this many tries and, and our trials and tribulations to get to where I'm trying to be. So I, I don't know. I think it's, it's fascinating to break down those other things. Yeah, it is. And, um, it, what's interesting about, it's a really cool way of actually getting this material too. Cause he's in the video on uh, his Instagram, he's playing the tape and talking over it. He's like, okay, so now you can oh, hear it. Like, so it's not just that you hear it, you're, you're hearing him explain and he's kind of laughing like, yeah, I kind of messed up there. And, oh, and, that's cool. and what's nice is you're, you're like, oh yeah, like that's like this idea. It's not, you know what it's going to become, but it's not really <laughs> remarkable yet. It's not what it is. It's, it's just like being, yeah. it's growing. It's a little seed. It's, um, and it makes you realize like, yeah, like I know that feeling of when this idea, I, I think it's something, 
trying to nurture it into like a plant that will blossom. And uh, you, yeah. you hear the work that goes into it too. That it it doesn't just it's not like here it is da 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 and I've got my song and it's a classic song that yeah right gonna they love. go into it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, if, yeah. it was the, it was the same way too. And uh, to go back to the Beatles when they released the "Let It Be," uh, "Get Back" film, if you saw that, right. it was like nine hours oh, of yeah. them <laughs> in rehearsing. I know. I loved yeah. it though, but and it's like you hear these like classic songs, like trying to break through a little guitar riff or a little uh -huh. mumbling kind of melody. It's not. It's like it's trying. It's like the chickens trying to get out of the egg. <laughs> it's so exciting to hear it. Like we're hearing, you know, like you said, knowing how the song ends, it's like you're replaying the process backwards and it's just such a unique thing. I mean, you don't see that in a lot of other instances in life where you can kind of like go back and see how it started mm. like that. And, and you're kind of hearing it before they do at the time, you know, because they're, they hadn't mm. figured it out yet. So it's uh, that was that apparent in a lot of the that get back doc of just them all these songs coming before they had known what they had yet and you're like that, that that's it you got it <laughs> it's weird it, at the same time it kind of humanized them and humanized yeah. the creation of these songs and amazed me and blew me away mm. like wow like they took that and turned it into this but at the same time, well, they worked, they sweated over, they sweat over it. They, the little arguments and discussions and like, it wasn't magic, but it was so magical. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. It can kind of like, you know, you think of what's going on and you might have this like magical idea and then you kind of see the process and you're like, Oh, okay. I've, I've been there with bands or projects and you, you kind of see, but that's like they're not unique in how they work in that sense of like it's just they're just figuring it out. So like it could ruin some of the mystique, I guess. But yeah, it, I think it I think it's fascinating to see that it is just you know a typical process that that a lot of people go through, and they still ended up with you know I mean that's the what what really blew me away is like how actually committed they were to a schedule of like hey we get up at this time we're here this early and then some people obviously were, were late if you see some of the film where they're there uh and you can't contact people in that time that was another crazy thing is yeah, they're just like we just, just have to wait for him to show up where's you know? john <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's fascinating but no it's it's crazy to see how much they did really put in during those days of like they were long hours i mean that was a full-time job like making all yeah. this music so it's it's cool to see yeah I, I think it's more beautiful that it's like that than as if it was some magical gift passed on from the heavens or something as it can sometimes feel yeah. you know to see oh. to see uh wayne coin work on that song and show you like this i uh, just had an acoustic and i'm just blabbering into this one track and it's it's just like yeah like wow and you were able to do this with that song and you brought it to your bandmates and you know time and time again in the get back doc it's just so cool that it, it's a, just a product of the work and, and like you said it is really neat to see the discipline behind it even if some of them are late once in a while like they're still showing up and they're still getting to work and you know, yeah. I'm sure you've and played this time in bands. they're like at each other's throats too. Yeah, and they're still like, all right, well, let's get the thing done. And I mean, that's such commitment that you gotta like. It's just marvel at the intensity that, that they put into making that happen. Yeah. It ended up being like the end, but still, it was, it was a cool process to see it unfold. Hmm. Yeah, you see them at their throats, but you also see them like they really do care for each other, and it's it's nice. Yeah. I, you know that was always said to be like you can see the Beatles break up in that movie I guess the original one but I, I took away like they're they're friends these are guys that like yeah. really do love each other and um, even of course like you know this that crazy ride's gonna cause some issues it does with everybody I mean life just does that with people you don't even have to be the Beatles <laughs> and uh, you know <laughs> friends go and different directions and all of that. Um, 
I, I want to ask you, you know, before we kind of keep going on、uh, all this other stuff, but it's really pretty interesting and cool that you are using Super 8 film on, on your videos. And it, again, this just lends to this whole like aesthetic that you've really done a nice job of having this nice, consistent feeling to all your work. And the,、uh, this, I mean, I've never used a Super 8 camera before. And, I'm sure it presents all kinds of challenges, but it really does have a cool look. That's, it just it's、yeah. feel, it feels、I、like something right away. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so that the camera I use is from 1965. It's like all original. It's like, I think that's the first year that Super 8 was introduced. And just to get the film for it, it's, they only make, Kodak makes like three or four different types of Super 8 film, but it's like, $50 for a roll, which is about three to four minutes of footage. Okay. And then you have to get that then developed,、uh, which is another, you know, 20, 30 bucks at times. Which, by the way, I'm not getting this developed in Denver. There, they, there's not yeah, a lot of ways to even go. Do <laughs> I have to ship my, all my film, I have to ship to this place called Spectra Film、uh, in California that I just like using.、And、there's a few places over.、Uh, In the US that do this, but I really like Spectra and the work they do, kind of scanning. And、uh, they, they also scan it too, but they, they mostly develop. That's kind of what I use them for.、Um, but yeah, I, I mean, so it's a, it's a time commitment too of like, I can't, you know, after I get the footage back, then I have to get it scanned,、um, which I do have a, luckily a, a friend in, in Denver that scans the stuff. He does a lot of work for the museum here. And,、uh, He's able to scan my footage for me, but that's just a whole nother process. I mean, just to see, you know, from, from start to finish, it's a couple of weeks before I see the footage that I even make.、Yeah. And it's like that ends up being, you know, I've used it on a lot of my music videos up to this point and just some other stuff that I've kind of shot around and played with that I have coming down the pipe.、Um, but it's, it's such a commitment that it puts me in a really cool space as a filmmaker to sit there and, like, all right, I have, you know, three to four minutes. Per role, I have to make this count. I mean, that's shorter than some of the songs at times. So I'm already using more more than one role just to cover the length of the song. And that's not including you know anything I don't use. So you've got to be really intentional with what you're shooting and have a plan. And I just think it it's it's really fun to do it that way, you know, because you could shoot with your your phone or you could shoot with you know a lot of these really awesome digital cameras that I've, I've shot some videos with that. So I'm not putting down digital by any means. Um, but you, you just have so many options. You can sit there and record. You just leave the camera on if you wanted to, and you're just really only limited by storage capacity at that point. But as far as the medium itself, things can go wrong with Super 8, too. You could shoot all this footage and it comes back and you had it a little bit you know, wrong. The exposure could have been a little bit off and things like that. So it's just put a really cool element into.、Uh, Match. It's by basically the visual component to match what I do in the studio. And it just works hand in hand、um, to kind of capture that sort of spirit of that early days, 60s, 70s sort of filmmaker and musician like headspace that this is the limitation they had. And again, I, I like、mm-hmm. to really play around with that and put myself in that spot. So it's, yeah, it's been a fun thing to play with having a super eight involved, just a lot of work, work at times for sure. Oh man, I bet. I mean, when I do any kind of video work, most of it gets thrown out. You know,、yeah. like you cut most of it. <laughs>、yeah. It's just,、um, I mean, you have to, otherwise, you just have like all this extra stuff. But at that, the disadvantage of that is exactly what you said that you can just kind of try a whole bunch of things, not even really have much of an idea, and throw things together. Um, and then, since you have such a you know, collection of material, you can put something, make something out of it. But、um, I, I guess this again, this is, it's a lot like recording to tape, too. You can't just、mm-hmm. start winging it on a four track or an eight track tape recorder. You have to have a plan. You have to know how many tracks you're going to use for this and that and save space for vocals later or whatever you're going to do. There's, there's more of an intentionality to it. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's absolutely true. Like, there's plenty of times where 
it, it's almost convenient too for me though the way i've like tried to do it is like, like i'll be trying to shoot and i know what my next shot's going to be so i already get that framed up and lined up ready to go and then i i shoot and then I mean, you're pulling the trigger on a super race so it's kind of sitting there you know pulling the trigger and as soon as i stop it ends it cuts the shot and, and that's just a lot of times that ends up being the perfect Im amount of material for what i needed because like like you said I, I have to be so intentional with it like this is the shot so let's make it count and of course there's stuff that i don't use and that i throw away but um even in those moments i think i, I kind of just set set it aside and see if i can use it in another way like all of my scraps from my uh unused film like there's got to be ways to kind of repurpose this and maybe a, a psychedelic way like some of when to, to touch on that, some of what I started doing uh, during the pandemic as well was like taking the film itself and uh, experimenting with painting it and, and burning it, bleaching it, and you're doing all these different forms of like physical manipulation to the film and then re-scanning it. And you get a lot of different results than what you originally had. So it's like I can even repurpose a lot of the, you know, I guess, outtakes and things like that things that i don't use i can kind of you know use them in different ways so i started making there's another music video that i have called lost at sea mm. and that is where i'm using the painted film technique where the whole video is made by painting film and then rescanning it so everything you're seeing is, is a physical medium there's no digital art happening there it's just kind of a fun thing i wanted to play with and uh even got myself a splicer to try to like cut the tape and and or cut the film and edit it together myself. And I did that a little bit on my first uh, video. And then it was kind of like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to do the rest of this digitally. It's, it's kind of a nightmare to, to splice together and do those things. But I just wanted to experiment with what, what was it like? And kind of, I think you get, you gain such a respect for the people that did this, even, you know, albeit that's their only option. They have to do it that way, but it's just such a, they have to really want to do it to, to make this art because it was, it was not the easiest thing to make so it's just mm. it, it's it makes you really look at some of their work differently I think. yeah that video is awesome i love that and it definitely harkens back to the it, it remind me a little bit of um like back when i was a kid when you'd go to a movie theater you know before the movie started it wasn't all oh, yeah like, now it's all commercials you know yeah. <laughs> like, they make it out like it's an event you're watching some <laughs> show but it's just all commercials <laughs> But right. it used to just be music, and I, I don't know if it's like it's almost like lava lamp looking mm -hmm. things that would go, like bubbles that would go on the screen. I don't know how they did it, but it's it was something they were mani manipulating. It was physical, and it was just a cool thing to walk into when you go into the theater. Um, I don't know if you know anything about that, but I, uh, I don't actually know about that. But I mean, I'm sure it is like like you said, it's, it's some sort of physical media. I love the, like, even when they did title cards back in the day, a lot of times it was like they, somebody wrote out all that stuff and then they're just shooting the, the picture of the <laughs> words and like, that's the title card. I mean, it's right. just like, that's a different time. It's just so yeah. fascinating. Some of the elements of that. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. The, the video looks great though. The way the art moves and like you see the paint strokes, you really see them on the film and, um, Thanks it's like it's living you know it's like alive yeah that's fun to play with and it's um and i want to try doing more of that too I, I, there's another one coming out actually uh at the end of this year or it might actually come out the start of next year but it's in tandem with this album and it goes with one of the tracks called uh hanging on through the winter and what i did was i took um i took leaves in various stages of their life cycle and attach them to the film in order. So as you watch it, you can see the leaves start to decay. Hmm. And that's going to be kind of like uh, the, scent, the essence of the next music video that I'm putting out. So very excited to release that. And, and again, that's another like physical way to, to really see, but I'm really happy with how that came out. But yeah, it was a, it was a nightmare attaching all these, like physically making this was not easy. So, <laughs> I mean, it took hours upon hours to, attach the leaves to the film and things like that. But the end result you get is just something that I couldn't recreate digitally or anything like that. It's just such a cool thing. It just looks so real. It just, it feels real watching back. And that's the kind of thing that inspired me to do that is some of these older films, I've been really inspired by 
some experimental filmmakers from the 60s. There's one called Stan Brockage. He did a lot of stuff where he had he had this film called Mothlight, where he would take uh, like dirt and moth wings and particles and just like things, living organisms and attach them to the film. And the actual like fluttering of the projector would make it sound like moth wings flying. So you like, I mean, that's just like a thing I don't think people are doing <laughs> anymore. Like yeah. those kind of things. It's just like, I wanted to kind of put myself in that, sp- in that space and, and play around with those mediums. Hmm. I mean, that, this must be so time consuming. I mean, we're going, as, as we start talking about this, um, from you, uh, dubbing the cassettes yourself to yeah. putting the art together to stick in the cassettes and then dealing with, um, the limitations of the camera and the film. Um, that's, it's a lot of attention to detail. Um, it takes a while. Do you, um, is it, I, I can almost see it like sometimes the monotony of things like that is meditative. Yeah. yeah. I think so. I think it's very much, yeah, it gives me a sense of like, this is what this moment is going to entail if you're going to get to this end result. So like it it gives me a clearer layout of the process in a way. And obviously things shift and change, but it's, it's very meditative to kind of sit through and especially attack. I mean, sitting there and like painting film, I mean, that's just Mm -hmm. relaxing in itself. I know a lot of people get a lot of enjoyment from painting and just putting putting art down to canvas. So this is kind of like my version of that. I get frustrated when I'm painting on the, on canvas or anything like that. I'm not a painter by any means, but at least painting on film and experimenting with that is like, it doesn't have to look good what I'm actually painting because a lot of times it translates in a really cool way in an unexpected way when it's kind of scanned. You see, I mean, you're painting a tiny frame that's like this size and then that becomes the whole image of the screen once it's projected. So you see little blemishes, you see like dirt is up mm. on the screen. I mean, probably skin from my, the, my hand. I mean, there's probably all kinds of particles and just weird thing going on. And that's just becomes a part of the final thing. So mm. yeah, it's a, it's a fun meditative process. I would say you really hone in on what you're doing. And, I don't know. You really zone out. Mm. When I first released a solo album, I did it on, uh, it was CDR and I was burning all the CDRs and then you'd get the, these like little kits that have the stickers you can put on. And for every, I probably made like 150 CDs. Okay. Um, but I was using watercolor on the, the, uh, labels instead of like printing on the labels, which I don't even know if I knew how to do. (laughs) I just (laughs) took watercolor and just made like sometimes pictures, sometimes abstract things and I'd numbered them all. Um, it was a lot of fun. And it was just like yeah. I'd take an afternoon and just like kind of sit there and just put some music on and just fool around watercolors for a little while. And it it was, they're all little small things and abstract, but then when you take them off and you put them on there and the, now every album is unique and different. Yeah. Now that's how it was with the cassettes too. I actually did all of the like stamping on the on the cassette itself of like putting the the little different designs. And I would put, uh, or I, I did put. I think I made a short run of. Um, I, I can't remember how many designs it was, but every record or every cassette basically has its own unique stamping on it. So it's it's kind of a fun thing to add in there. If you pick up a cassette, you're going to get a completely unique version and unique to the digital and the vinyl release because of that, you know, the format and the speed obviously increased that I had to deal with. So it's like a kind of a different like sound. It doesn't even sound the same as the digital version. So Mm. yeah, that process alone though, just making the cassettes, I probably spent about 15 to 20 hours just between all of the stamping and like sealing everything and making the artwork. And yeah, I mean, but like you're saying, you just it's it's a lot of fun doing. I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. It's not it's not to save money or anything like that. I mean, that's obviously it helps. You actually a lot of you're using your own resources, but it, a part of that to me is just like I want to be there every step of the process. I want to take out as many yeah. of the the other things as I can. Yeah, I mean, you could probably uh, 
if you were worried about money, it would probably make more sense to get them printed out and then spend half that time like driving an Uber or something. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> but if I was worried about money, I probably wouldn't even make cassettes because I don't right. think that's the huge market. Yeah, you know, it's true. A, you know, they're funny. They're coming back too, which I've seen more and more yeah. bands like I've seen on tour and they pick out like a cassette and a vinyl with them. And I'm like, that's, that's cool that that's kind of coming back in a way. It's just a fun, cheaper version of a vinyl in a way. It's, um, yeah. You know, can't store as much information but they sound good in their own way yeah and i i've noticed there's it's not all of not every kid but a lot of kids these days are kind of fascinated by this stuff like they're like oh wow yeah. this, is, this is the tape and like oh they unfold it and they're like oh that's so cool you know yeah um and in my class at school um you know, i have high school students and uh at, at one point in the year i'll bring in like a record player and some albums and uh, just like they they do like a project, they're putting together like their portfolio, and they got to come up with a design. So I bring in albums and uh, and play records for them. And they're like, "What?" It's I'm like it sounds <laughs> on this thing. Like you turn yeah. off the speaker and you let them hear it, and that it's coming out of the needle. Yeah. That's wild. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's such a cool thing. Yeah, I I do. Um, my buddy does this um, video game expo here on long island and um okay. like retro video games and it's my job to yeah. like dj it basically play music so he's got just all these old video game soundtracks that were made onto vinyl records and i it's it's a fun experience because a lot of times you get like a mom or a dad with their kid and they come up and they look at it and like hey look at that you know what that is and so many of the kids are like it's a cd and they're like no <laughs> <laughs> so like they're like right. learning about these mediums for the right. first time it's pretty fun it's fun i mean eventually we're going to get to the generation too that doesn't even know what a cd is because that's i mean really coming that might already be partially our gen like the next generation that we're occurring i mean their cds kind of came and went uh yeah. pretty quick too so well you know wayne of the flaming lips uh was talking about the release and that it's like six or eight cds i think oh, really? uh, and um he's like cds you know they're getting a little popular again i think they did uh, they did go up a little bit in sales in the last year or two okay. um <laughs> one of my friends actually the same guy the video game guy he he put a cd player in his house okay. um you know because so much music has gotten like as much as the technology has improved and we can stream like the quality of those streams are oh yeah although apple's doing like you know lossless now and but you still need uh i guess you can't do it through like your airpods mm -hmm. it's it's not lossless in that case i don't think but <laughs> that fidelity is like kind of cool yeah. to hear again oh yeah i mean when i first heard cds i was like wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah it sounds so much better than my tape <laughs> that's true yeah i mean it, yeah i guess it, it's funny the progression of sound like that too and i mean it is another physical medium i mean i guess eventually that'll be seen as like you know a vintage medium right you get the, C the cds so, i was I mean. looking for <laughs> a plug-in actually that really? would mimic cd skipping you know that really? like, that kind yeah. of weird digital glitch you get uh, yeah. i didn't find anything uh but you got like tape emulation vinyl emu emulation right. and I was that's like, the next thing you're gonna have to make some cd emulation um, yeah. skipping i mean you could sit there and do it with animation or automation about that would probably take you a minute to to recreate but it's like a weird specific kind of glitch because it's a scratch or a uh -huh. blemish or dirt yeah. Uh, I'll have to make like a an instrument pack that I record all yeah, my samples right. to CDs and <laughs> <laughs> CD pack. That's pretty good. Yeah, it's funny. So um we should probably tell people like where they can get the record, right? I think you have it on Bandcamp. Yeah, right? Totally. And I'm on yeah, streamings. everything yeah, all the streaming everything about me is at Julian Fulco Pro. So, you know, Instagram's mm -hmm. your Facebook's YouTube, TikTok, all that good stuff. It is at Julian Fulco Prone. Not the easiest name to spell, so sorry guys. You have to do some some reading to make sure you get that right. But um, and my website, JulianFulcoProne.com. I've got yeah, like we were talking about the vinyls, cassettes are all available, all hand shipped. This is a one man operation, so cool. You know, I'll, I'll send you a little message. 
<laughs> um, I love the videos on Instagram. You do like the old like '80s commercials for like oh, featuring thanks. the hits, blah blah blah. And <laughs> yeah, you had like show the different finals, and you like. I think you said like, "What's wrong with my pea yellow?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's wrong with yeah? I like that phone. The promo too. The promo kind of is like, great. It's um again, it's like got a vibe to it that's consistent with what you're doing, and it, it makes it fun. And you know, it, there's that's like that hear. nice element like where. You know, I guess like you said yourself, it's not parody necessarily, but it shows like a, a lightheartedness. Yeah, to, to a little more personality to it. Like I think in, in the beginning, it was easy to like, I mean, in every band you just want to, you know, it's hard to know how to portray certain things. It's like in my day to day life, I like to make people laugh. I like to have fun with things and, and be kind of a, a clown. And in, in, as far as just joking around, it's like, and I realize like, well, that doesn't come through necessarily with my art and it should, it's just an extension mm -hmm. of myself. So I think that's part of that is where that comes from is just having fun with the infomercials. And there was one I did too, that was like, you know, you, the old radio spots where it would play like a five second snippet. It's like the beach boys new album coming this, you know, I, I made one of those mocked up for this album. It's kind of like, an old radio spot um, right so just nice. playing with those old, old 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 promo of the day and recreating it today so yeah but that's that's great to hear that from an, from your perspective of like you know seeing everything together it all fits and it's very cohesive because it's, it's easy to get lost in that as the person doing all these things so that's good to hear that it, that comes across it's nice because you know even though the music i guess is the main thing all the stuff around it really does affect it. I mean, even like like the colors, right? Like a lot of like the yellow mm -hmm. and orange, um, yeah. and the, the lettering is that kind of like old school, you know. It's like yeah. a, it's like a hippie looking writing, you know. You're right. Um, yeah. But it it like I've always felt this like on albums I love like they they sound like the color scheme of the record, and right. and that's. I'm sure it's a hundred percent just be an association I make, but it does sort of give it this feeling, you know, even, even for us, when we got our album artwork back, our buddy Darren did it for us. And I mean, he does awesome art. Once we saw that, it's like, ah, like it just yeah. added something to it. You know, even for yeah. us, just like, oh, now it sounds like, it sounds like the art and the art looks yeah. like this, the music. <laughs> do you typically in your creation, do you kind of, do you, do you put the music first and then your art will come after? Uh, is that typically how it works for, for you? Or I've done it both ways. Yeah. Um, so sometimes, yeah, like sometimes visual stuff is nice. Sometimes even just putting something like on the screen to make music too, or, or if yeah. um, I have like an idea for like the, what the album's gonna be, getting that together helps, you know, okay. like um, I, I do like that to have sort of this like vision of it. And I think even when we were doing our album, we kind of knew we were gonna ask him to do the work and we know the style he does. So okay. it, it kind of- that mind space, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if it changes the music, but it, it helps like so much about when I'm making a song is like, I remember like asking like my sister this, like when I was first trying to make a song, I was like, does this sound like a song? Like, is like, is this, a, does this sound like it's a song, you know, or is this yeah. just playing my guitar? And, and sometimes when I have like the visual thing going, it, it's, it's, there's like a world for it or something. There's, it's, it exists. Yeah, I don't know how to like exactly explain what I meant when I would say, does this sound like a song? Almost like a buddy of mine actually in high school, we, we made a bunch of, we were like trying to be annoying really, but like we were allowed to play music in our art class in high school. So we were trying to make songs that were like really ridiculous, but people wouldn't know that it was us. Okay. And they yeah. knew right away because we'd be laughing hysterically in the class. <laughs> but it was like we would ask ourselves does this sound like a song like could this be like a song that somebody made <laughs> but yeah. it, it is obviously because we made it but there's some sort of like legitimacy i guess 
that happens when you start to see the picture, you start to see what it is. Well, the reason I asked is because this was the first album I think that I've done or the first like, you know, with any project where all the artwork was kind of wrapped up before I really knew where I was going musically. It's just kind of, this was what I was inspired by at the time is like, I've got the backdrop behind me for the Yeah, album you know, I didn't realize, I recognized that from the tiny desk concert on your site. Yeah. Um, but I didn't realize that it was in the art um, until because yeah. I, I don't see like the letters so well. You're, right, yeah, it's you're in the way a little bit. Little JFP, <laughs> but it's like yeah. an old school like theater type banner. I wanted to make it look like a set, like a physical set yeah. that we were yeah, on. Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Well, great, and that's, that's cool. kind of yeah. That kind of came in 2020. We took those photos like August of 2020, like the middle of the pandemic, and then now the album's obviously just coming out like uh, on the 11th. It did so it's funny to look back and realize like, Oh yeah, I took all that really before I knew what I was making. Like it just mm. kind of, that was the vibe I was going for. And then the music kind of followed suit. Whereas the other times you make the music based on how you're feeling and the art comes after to kind of fit and encompass what the music is. But this was more of just like a reverse of that, but it still worked just fine. And, and I wouldn't say it was better or worse or anything, but it's just, I was curious to, your approach on that or if, if you'd experienced something like that too. So it's not a kind of realization I had recently. Well, the times that I've done it, I've kind of felt like it came easier, mm -hmm. you know, like it, um, the ideas either fit or didn't. Yeah. And, um, I, I don't know how much of this is real or just like in my head, but right. it, uh, it it gives you kind of like a target or something to aim at and mm -hmm. and then other times when i make the times i've made art afterwards it honestly usually got less attention it was it was more like yeah. i need a cover for this right yeah exactly no <laughs> yeah. that's fair that's fair it's like the visual component really adds a lot so like as you're making the music you mm -hmm. kind of have this visual in your head already of like well this is does it fit with this like I hope, mm. you know if not it might go somewhere else but I think there is some truth to that for sure. Yeah, I don't know that I ever really thought about that so much as a tool, like almost like a songwriting tool to yeah. have it, have the visual there. If anything, it's it'd be just kind of like for a vibe. Like if I put something yeah. on the screen or something, sometimes even just like totally. cartoons or movie or something, right. um, painting maybe, but it's more just for the vibe of me making the music at that time, not so much for the vibe of the music, if that okay. makes sense. Yeah, I think so. So I'll have to try that again, um, because I think it did help the times yeah. I had it. And I could see how this would work for you too. You kind of got this thing and now we're gonna, let's make the songs for this cover <laughs> almost. Right, yeah. I think maybe I had like kind of started, but I hadn't really figured out where it was going musically or anything yeah. like that you know so but then yeah as soon as you put it to, to film and, and that's another thing too to keep it with that analog sort of aesthetic is we take all our photos with 35 millimeter cameras so it's all film photos and it's just like when we took those photos and like just encapsulated like this is what i was inspired by at the time like let's keep that going and yeah it just really fit to keep the music thematically with with what we had captured on film there with those photos so it was a, it was a cool process it kind of went more in tandem i guess than like completely finishing the art and then like now let's start writing the music but it, it was for sure not a finished idea i don't think musically as far as what is this going to sound like what is the genre we're going for here or what is the the style and so yeah i don't know hmm. yeah it makes sense for it to kind of come together yeah as one yeah, rather than so. now we need to stick a cover or now we need yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. now we need music <laughs> exactly now we need music it's it's one of the time here <laughs> yeah. that's funny well cool man it, this is great um i'm really happy for you that you got this done and you were productive during that time and put out something cool and it's really nice you know i've, I've sensed it obviously just from our conversations before this and looking at the stuff you're making that there's a lot of detail and 
I, I don't know how you find the time to do it all, actually. Now, now that we've talked about it, it's like, wow. Because it's <laughs> a lot of little things that um, I, I could imagine how easy it would be to justify going digital. Like, uh, you know what, let's just, instead of the film, let's just put the filter on and final cut yeah. or something. And it'll be 95% of that. But right. when you go that extra 5% on every little step, the the whole thing really benefits a lot. And that's pretty evident with what you're doing. Thanks. Well, that, that's awesome to hear. And, and I just want to say thanks again for, for having me on. It's, it's been really yeah, cool course. to now be on after like, I've, I've been listening to your, your podcast for a while now. So before the pandemic, even I think I found you and I, I picked up a lot of tips from a lot of the more like psychology or the psychology of, of songwriting that you touch on sometimes. And like, that's helped a lot with the way I do things. So, you know, thank you for, for some of the things that have kind of geared how I write and some of the things I do. So yeah, it's come full circle now that being able to kind of talk and like, share some of my experiences with some other listeners. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Cause uh, I feel inspired talking to you. Right. Nice positive feedback loop there. There we go. Well, you'll have to come on my podcast when I make one and We'll come oh yeah no. that'd be great <laughs> that'd be great to catch up with you again and talk so <laughs> cool so we will tell people i'll spell it out it's j-u-l-i-a-n-f-u-l-c-o-p-e-r-r-o-n and that is that is there a dot com for that right that was there's yes, a dot that, com for that yeah so that you know that's like the hub i guess and uh yep. it's streaming it's on apple it's on spotify and uh youtube video it's definitely worth checking out the youtube videos obviously after all we spoke about with the film stuff but um yeah check out julian's work so thank you and thank you for listening to the show take care